Our second lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 39 and 40. When they, Joseph and Mary, had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child, Jesus, grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In a Christmas Eve sermon at Duke University Chapel six years ago, Sam Wells, who was then dean of the chapel, asked his congregation to think about three scenarios. Now, I know it's been 90 degrees for most of the week, but for a moment, I want you to imagine yourself in the Christmas season and its cooler weather as we consider these scenes. The first is buying a gift for a family member with whom you have a complicated relationship. Maybe it's a sibling or a parent. You've gotten all the rest of your gifts for family, friends, and colleagues, but you just can't figure this one out. And your inability to come up with the perfect gift starts to become a metaphor for this relationship as a whole, the way you've never really had the relationship with this person that you want. In the end, you throw money at the problem, although you know that buying something isn't really the answer. When the present is opened, you can see that you failed yet again to bridge the chasm between you. The second scene, you have family or friends coming for a few days at the holidays and you are frantically preparing. You exchange texts about the details, where they will sleep, can they bring the dog? You plan meals and go shopping and spend most of their visit in the kitchen. As they leave, you hug and say, it's such a shame we never really talked while you were here. And as soon as their car leaves the driveway, you collapse on the sofa, maybe even shed a few tears of exhaustion and regret. The third scene, you spend the weeks before Christmas feeling a nagging guilt as you buy and wrap gifts, knowing there are so many people in dire need, people who are spending this season in poverty, in isolation, in grief. So at the last minute, you pick up some presents for the Toys for Tot drive and return some of the presents you've bought, using the money instead to buy a hen or a cow or a share of a buffalo for people in another country who need the resources more than anyone on your list. What do all of these scenes have in common? Sam Wells says it's the word for. Every one of us is accustomed and even conditioned to showing that we care for family, friends, or strangers by doing things for them, buying gifts for them, cooking meals for them, offering charity for them. There is nothing wrong with any of this. Each of these things in their own way is a meaningful and generous gesture. But we can all attest to the fact that doing something for someone is rarely, if ever, enough to overcome disconnection, misunderstanding, or isolation. For rarely serves to build or transform relationships. At best, for maintains the status quo. God shows us a different way. At the beginning of Matthew, the Gospel writer quotes the prophet Isaiah, the same passage we heard this morning, but adds a helpful definition of the Hebrew word. Behold, the young woman shall conceive and bear a child, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God is, of course, for us. This is the foundation of everything we believe. God provides for us. God cares for us. God longs for us. But the reason we know that is true is because in the person of Jesus Christ, God chose to be with us. 
Today, as you heard, we begin a new program year and with it a sermon series on location. In worship over the next couple of months, we'll look at episodes in Jesus' life and consider the role location plays. How is God with us on earth in the person of Jesus? How did the specific places Jesus visited influence his words or actions? How do those locations help us better understand our calling as Jesus' disciples, who are called not just to do for, but be with the world God so dearly loves? We begin in Nazareth. As we heard in the Gospel of Luke, after Mary and Joseph did what they needed to do to fulfill the religious laws, they went home. They went to Nazareth. And there, in this specific location, Jesus lived. Although we often think what matters most in our tradition is what happened on Calvary, the cross, or at the empty tomb near Jerusalem, or on the road to Emmaus where the resurrected Christ walked and talked with his disciples, none of these things would have been possible without what first happened in Nazareth, God's very being incarnated in human flesh for 30 years, lived and grew, ate and played and learned, ran and jumped and loved and fought like any one of us. The Bonus Army was a group of World War I veterans who marched on Washington, D.C. in 1932. They came there to demand payment of certificates they had received in 1924. These certificates represented bonus pay for their military service, but they could not be cashed until 1945. During the Great Depression, most of these men found themselves out of work and desperate for money, so they came to Washington. Along with their wives and children, they numbered nearly 43,000 people, and they camped out in a swampy, muddy area of the city while they waited for the government to respond to their demands. Well, the response they got was President Hoover sending in the active military with tanks and guns to evict them. Many believe this incident is one reason Hoover lost the presidential election in a landslide to Franklin Roosevelt later that year. Now, like Hoover, Roosevelt opposed the bonus army's demands. The truth was the government simply couldn't afford to cash out the bonuses. But when a second demonstration was organized just a few months after Roosevelt took office and more veterans returned to the city with their families, Roosevelt provided the, camp the marchers with a campsite and three meals a day. But Eleanor Roosevelt thought they could go one step further. Traveling without secret service, she drove across Washington one day to the Bonus Army camp and spent an entire day with the veterans and their families. She sat with them around a campfire, ate beans out of a can with her fingers with them, listened to them talk about their lives and their struggles. Although she could not meet their demands regarding the bonus pay, she promised each one of them a job with the newly created Civilian Conservation Corps, and President Roosevelt delivered on that promise. The day after Eleanor's visit to that camp, the headline of two major newspapers proclaimed, Hoover sent the troops, Roosevelt sent his wife. We all know the difference between someone doing something for us and someone being with us. And let's be honest, there are times we would much prefer the former, particularly from God. After all, for is transactional. You do this for me, and I'll do that for you. For is measurable, predictable even. When we are the doer or the recipient of for, we know where we stand. With is a whole different story. With is not transactional, it is relational. And relationships, while wonderful on many levels, are also terribly hard work. 
They are unpredictable. They are messy. They involve an astonishing range of emotions. And relationships are dangerous because they have the capacity to change us, to totally transform us. And most of us, most of the time, would prefer to keep things the way they are. Over and over again in the Bible, we discover that God prefers to be with us rather than do for us, precisely because God longs to transform us, to move us past lives that take us from one transaction to another, and instead to help us live more fully, deeply, and relationally. We see this in the, in the prophet Isaiah with the promise of Emmanuel, God with us. We see it at the beginning of the Gospel of John when we learn about how God and Jesus are with each other. The Word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. We see it at the end of the Gospel of Matthew when the risen Christ tells his disciples, remember, I am with you always. This deep, intimate, meaningful relationship is the foundation of the being of God, and that is what came to Nazareth in the person of Jesus. There in the neighborhood streets and at the family table, the boy Jesus learned what it is to be human. He came to earth and lived a normal, unremarkable, utterly human life for 30 years, so that when Jesus finally started his ministry, those from his hometown couldn't believe he was claiming any kind of special religious knowledge or status. Sam Wells says it this way, Nazareth is important, not because it is a stage on the way to something more significant, but precisely because it is an extended window into heaven. God and humanity in peaceable interaction, perhaps with good work, perhaps with good food, perhaps with learning and growing and nurturing and celebrating, but fundamentally just being. Nazareth reminds us that we don't earn God's love by doing something for God or anyone else by following a set of rules or adhering to a schedule of religious observance, Nazareth reminds us first and foremost that God is with us and invites us into transformative relationship. No wonder Nazareth is barely mentioned in the Gospels. We are much more comfortable with all that Jesus did for humanity in his three years of ministry, the healing, the teaching, the forgiving, even the dying and the raising, that makes so much more sense to us than this idea of God living among us and being with us. And yet it is that that shows us the power of with. Last week, the beloved children's author Anna Dudney died she was best known for a series of books featuring a character named Llama Llama, a little llama who struggles with the kinds of things all children struggle with, leaving their parents to go to school for the first time, feeling scared and alone at bedtime, getting mad when things don't go your way. A few years ago, Dudney wrote an editorial for the Washington Post about the importance of teaching children empathy and how reading to a child does just that. She writes, we learn empathy as children through our interactions with the people in our lives and by experiencing the world around us. When we read books with children, we share other worlds and even more importantly, we share ourselves. Reading with children makes an intimate human connection that teaches the child what it means to be alive as one of many beings on the planet. We are naming feelings, sharing experience, and expressing love and understanding all in a safe environment. When we read a book with children, then children are drawn out of themselves to bond with other human beings, to see and feel the experiences of others. It is this moment 
that makes us human. In Jesus, God teaches us that to be fully human is to be with, not just for. For only being with teaches empathy by practicing empathy. Before he was in Jerusalem, dying and being raised for us, before he was in Galilee, teaching and healing and feeding us, Jesus was in Nazareth, living with us. God with us teaches how to be with others, not just doing for them, but getting to know them, working to understand them, overcoming our assumptions about who they are and what matters to them. With is risky, it is dangerous, it is transformative, and it is how we engage what matters most, relationships. From Bethlehem to Nazareth to Calvary to Emmaus, from Willoughby to Shaker Heights to Solon to Lakewood and Avon to Glenville and Huff and East Cleveland to University Circle and Euclid Avenue, God chooses again and again and again to be with us, teaching us how to love, not by doing for, but by being with. Amen.